Perfect. We're live and we're just going to wait for a few more people to join. Um, and I'm sure a lot of them will join. Oh, well, we'll see this after it's already posted. Yeah. Um, but yeah, how was your day? My day was very good. We're in the middle of a snowstorm again in Toronto. So that's fun. I hate, yeah, I, I, was I hate the winter. I thought Sweden would have worse snow than Canada. Apparently not. We haven't had snow in like two weeks. Really? We had nothing. Yeah. We had nothing in December, nothing in January, barely anything in January. And then all of a sudden, oh, the wow. last two days, we've got the equivalent of like 20 centimeters. And oh, wow. I, hate, oh, I hate the snow. I hate the winter. I can't do winter. <laughs> I think I'm, it's a, I think it'll get, the snow will come here at like, early feb because it snowed in april in sweden last year really i always yeah. thought sweden got a lot of snow like when you think of sweden yeah, sometimes. you think of like just it's always snow yeah but but i also live in the south of sweden so like stockholm is technically the south so it goes really up above like there's oh, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so you guys there's don't a lot of how are your summers quite warm but very short um, I've only spent one summer in Sweden. I moved here the previous summer in 2021. Yeah. But that was like the end of summer. Oh, okay. okay. Um, but yeah, may may maybe we can get started now. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening to us blabbing about life. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of you may probably know Zayed, but if you don't, we have done a previous episode, I think almost three years ago when Zayed first came out to the public. Um, so it might clarify a little more on how Zayed was raised and his journey as well um, on this on this episode or this season, I guess, we'll be focusing a lot more content on life after Islam, but also kind of making it a more support corner like content. So kind of giving our tips and tricks, but also sharing ideas and disagreeing and challenging each other. Uh, this specific uh, podcast will be on raising children. So to clarify, no, I do not have kids, but say it does. So I will be a listener and I will take in all your questions and ask probing questions and maybe just put in my very um, my very un unsolicited um, opinions or what I of what I think uh, where situations can be tricky. Um, but yeah, say so do you do you want to start with saying a little bit about you and what you're doing on Instagram? Yeah, sure. So um, I live in Toronto. I live in Canada. I raised very liberal Muslim, um, left Islam four years ago. And stuff. Um, I do a, I do a lot of advocacy work here in Canada, and I'm online as well. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I've got two kids. We raise them uh, with no religion, no Islam, no nothing. Um, just humanist, sentientist values, as they're they're both vegan as well. Um, yeah, they're five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, two girls. And, um, yeah, we just kind of experience life as we go. I'm very much still learning. Um, I don't claim to be an expert. I do not have the golden key to raising, uh, non-religious kids. These are just my ideas, how I've done it, how some things have worked for me, how some things have just fell apart for me along the way. And, um, my kids have seen it all they've seen it all so i try not to hide anything from them so they've seen all the successes and failures where things where bridges have been built where walls have been put up instead of bridges um sometimes intentionally sometimes unintentionally um and then i explain to them why right and then um, they know that i'm not perfect i'm still learning and uh we have a really good relationship that way that's such a modest way of putting it and also quite humble as well which i really appreciate yeah. um but to start with, uh, I guess you left Islam about four years ago. So were both your daughters born um, while you were Muslim? Uh, no, no. So our older daughter, uh, she's now seven. When she was born, she was Muslim. We did the whole Shahada thing. We um, did the Akika as well. 
Um, I spoke about that in my previous video, uh, what, three years back. And um, that was actually a huge turning point for me, um, sacrificing uh, the animal and stuff. My wife was vegetarian at the time. She's now vegan. Um, I was not. I was just a regular meat eater or whatever, omnivore. And um, mm -hmm. that was a huge turning point for me, um, you know, seeing this innocent child being brought into the world and then having to perform a blood sacrifice to appease some some god. I was kind of deistic at the time, you know, just in the process of kind of questioning, not doubting per se, but questioning. And um, so that that led me to a lot of further questioning, which eventually I became an atheist. And um, so then my second, when my second daughter was born two and a half years later, we, I, I at least was uh, a full, I was full atheist, at anti-theist as well at the time. Um, my parents, however, they kind of knew. So they were still asking, like, hey, when are you going to shave? When are you going to shave her head? When, when are you going to do the Akika? When are you going to, you know, my, my parents were who were at the hospital when um, our second daughter was being born was like, hey, did you read the Shahada in her ear? Make sure you do that. And I was, just, I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. And I, you know, I never did it, right? Because at that time I was atheist, but closeted. So yeah, so one, one kid was born full on Muslim did the whole ritualistic stuff. And the other kid, I was kind of like, not happening, not going to happen. So she's never, she's never seen religion. Yeah. But we tell them stories. Inter people. Yeah. It's interesting. So what was your wife's react, like not reaction to you leaving, but when it came to not doing certain practices, because despite you coming from a liberal family, your parents were still adamant on you performing some of the traditions, like uh, the Shahada in the year, the Akika. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure if you had a son, it could probably, there would be a bigger question of circumcision then. Right. Yeah, yeah. I was, oh man. So so just touching on that son thing, I was scared. So we never found out the uh, the sex of our second, of um, Yana, that's her name. We never found out the sex of the baby. So it was a complete surprise. And I was like, please don't be a boy because I'm going to have to have this just hard conversation. I, I was not ready for that conversation if Yana ended up being a boy. So I always wanted girls. And I'm, I'm so thankful that I didn't have to touch on that circumcision, circumcision issue um, because there's no, way in, there's no way I would have done it, but that would have just been off the cliff in terms of relationship with the family and stuff. But, um, and I forgot your first question. <laughs> no, I, I guess it was, um, how did, how did your wife react to oh, uh, you not performing oh, those? Thankful. So, okay. So she was vegetarian at the time. So when it come when it came to, let's say the, the Akika, right. Slaughtering the animal, I lucked out because she was wholeheartedly against it in the first place. So the fact that we did it for the first one, it did traumatize her to, to, to no end. She like, she didn't cry, but she was very traumatized by it. The fact that we did it. And then I convinced her to do it and all that. And I explained all that in my first video. It's a pretty, pretty interesting story. Maybe we'll go back to it if we have time. But she was, she, she was really proud of me, actually, because she knew that at that point that I had learned from my mistake the first time. And I was completely open with her. And, you know, that was a main reason why I left Islam and all that kind of stuff. So she was really, she was really proud of me, if anything, that I, you know what, I stood my ground this time around. But um, I consider myself lucky that I have a wife that was vegetarian, just happenstance, you know, just completely arbitrarily, not because of Islam or anything or lack of Islam. Now, she was vegetarian. So when I was just like, no, I'm not going to do it this time, she was like, my man, you know, she was proud of me. Right. So. Uh, you know, fortunately, I don't have like a a, conf a conflict story there, but I'm lucky because yeah, I've heard some stories, man, and it can be brutal. It can, it can. I think losing a faith in a relationship can be a very make or break, and yeah. especially when I think not from my experience, but from other people's experiences, it can be quite. It can be much difficult or much harder when you have children oh, because. 100%. 
the biggest question, no matter like, you know, me dating somebody who's a different race or a different religion in like when I was younger, the biggest question the parents would have is, what are your kids going to be? Mm -hmm. And there was so much pressure. There was, you know, to a point that, um, and I mentioned earlier before the podcast that a lot of people were really excited about this podcast because even for people who don't have kids, this becomes to be a very difficult question um, that is imposed by their parents because now that we're older, we can put those boundaries saying, I'm not a Muslim. But then you're always pressured, like, when are you going to get married, have kids? And then even if you wanted to do that, you know, because your parents have this expectation that you're going to raise your child a certain way or in a halal way, it really it can be really repulsive to you as an ex-Muslim who has carried on a lot of trauma. And that trauma is uh, for some people quite massive. For others, it's a lot of um, ostracism, shunning that right. ends up building trauma. It's daunting, right? Like, and that's exactly why I was I was closeted for for two years actually because I was afraid to tell my wife that I was now a full on atheist because I was like, you know, this. I was thinking about the kids, but you know, like, you know, I was thinking at that point we had had Mila already, and I was like, you know, I'm already kind of unconventional in my personality and stuff like that like you know i was i'm not pakistani and the pakistani way to do things is be you know don't ask too many questions to your elders don't be skeptical just take it for what it is and do it right and that even when i was muslim i was not like that so you know my, my wife had to get used to that because that's how she was raised right and um i was closeted for two years because i was like this 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 is this this decision to come out in the open is going to have very real consequences. Um, if, like, what if she doesn't agree? What if she's just like, yo, yeah, you can believe whatever you want. I can be de deistic or whatever, or just a liberal Muslim, but I want my kids to be immersed in Islam. I want my kids to pick up Islam because we we dropped off type of thing, right? And I, I you know, like, I was afraid to even ask for two years until I was just like, you know what, I, whatever happens, I, 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 you know, I live in Canada. I, I I don't live in a third world country where I don't have the the choice. I have to live for me, right? I can't live in hiding for my entire life. So I I made that kind of weighed decision to be like I I I think my wife will be okay with it, right? But two years is a long time to be closeted, thinking about what's going to yeah. happen, the future of your kids, the future of your future of your relationship. You know, and, and, and you know, it kept me awake for day for nights nights on end thinking yeah I, and and i think it's it's really critical like i think relationships are built on honesty and communication and that could be like a make or break a lot of relationships tend to break because of the lack of honesty and communication and this is a big thing it's a change in not only how you will be living in the future but your sense of identity also gets lost and yeah. then now not only are you an individual you're a partner um and that is your new life it's uh, your parents are no longer controlling you so now your new family is the family you have yeah and, you, and you're also a parent there as well yeah so you're on you're, you're deconstructing everything while you're having a kid a baby a vulnerable baby so you know ideally you want to have things figured out but realistically you have you don't have anything figured out because you've just I just left Islam, right? So yeah. all my moral values that I that I thought were, you know, upright and moral, all my, you know, some, in some cases intellectual things like intellectual, you know, truths that I thought I knew, I, I had to relearn everything, right? So it's daunting. Yeah. But it is all reborn. Yeah, and I'm just gonna jump into two questions that might be related because we're on the topic of morality. So sure. I guess for me, the reason that you are moral is one, to do good, but also to pass on the good and obviously many different reasons. But in the specific context of um, having children, you would want to pass on the good morals and hopefully learn from your mistakes not to pass on the bad ones to your right. children. And in this case, because you left Islam and came out to your family, I'm pretty sure they had an idea or they thought that perhaps you're not that moral or, or now you have no morals. 
like not even a deep philosophical question, but it could be like, oh, you drink? Oh no, you don't have morals, something else. But then when it comes to the, you know, when it comes to the context of you raising children, um, given that you were also figuring it, you know, you're also figuring out what your values were. And sometimes it could have always been the values you were with. It just right. required reframing it. Yeah. So how did you navigate the conversations with your parents when it came to your children about what are you going to teach them? How are you going to raise them? And how did you navigate unlearning what you had known in the context of religion as morality to pass on why you should do good to your children? Right. So like, I think the way I communicated it to my parents or the way I kind of I always so remember I was always in this kind of learning as I go thing, right and one thing I learned is it's always better to build bridges than walls right and my parents I had to really although I just like they're they're Muslim they're not re very religious but they their core beliefs are, are very very religious are very Islam you know what I mean and um I had to tell myself, I had to, I had to really reinforce myself, but you know, like they, they do love my kids and everything that they want for my kids are good things. Right. So essentially like everything that they're suggesting that I do, it, it is coming from a good place. It's coming from a, from, you know, loving my child, you know? Um, so like everything I did with them, was centered around that concept of, like, okay, they do love my child, don't lash out, right? Um, sorry, what was, sorry, I got caught up in my... No, it's all, it's all good. I, I think you were getting, you were getting to the question, like, how, how did you counter the conversations with your parents about morality to your children? Oh, okay, yeah, And I then see. I'll come to the second question as you go, so yeah, not everyone, to confuse you. I ramble. So... When it comes to morale, so, okay, so with my parents and my wife's parents, we did have to set some boundaries, but, you know, I, because I was still very fresh um, in leaving Islam, I, 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 you know, I, I can't say that I approached this whole topic of atheism and anti-theism with, with humility and, you know, being humble, right? I was, I, you know, I had almost like a, like a vendetta against Islam. So I, I can see where, like, I'm not, I'm not completely innocent in where the bridges fell apart here when it comes to my parents. Right. But we did have to establish some boundaries because they were very adamant that my kids be Muslim. Right. They're like, fine, you go do whatever you want, but your kids need to be Muslim. And I did, obviously I didn't agree with that. So in my case, I had to build boundaries. Right. And we don't talk about religion you know when my kids go over when I go over we, we just don't have those conversations even though now if we were to have those conversations I would come at it from a completely different perspective than I did four years ago right and I'm a completely different person in how I approach these conversations now a little more, a little more nuanced and you know a little less you know blunt right so um I think it's important though for those who who's parents are engaging in those conversations to remember that in most scenarios obviously there are some parents that you know you know if you're if you're not muslim you're you're out of the family you're done type of thing but for most in most scenarios i think it's always beneficial to to just have it in the back of your mind that your parents love you your parents love your kids and with whatever they're saying, however outrageous it might seem to you, to them, their concern, their fears, whether it's like you're know, fearing for your, the soul of your child or, or what have you, it's real to them. So it's, it's a real concern for them. It's coming from a place of real care for them. And understanding that, I think, will help people kind of, it's almost like, you know, when they say, you know, just... Before you respond, count to 10. It'll help kind of just bring those moments down and just ground you and, you know, maintain a sense of calmness and humility when you disagree with points of view, you know, like I'm disagreeing with your point of view, not, you know, it's not that I'm disrespecting you, right? But I think having those kind of um, 
account, like those strategies help immeasurably, immeasurably, because I never, I, I never uh, knew how to do that. And I, I, not that I burn my bridges, my parents who, and my wife's parents who were like, we don't want to talk about religion with you. Even before I kind of got hot headed, but had the conversation continued, I knew I would have gotten hot headed. Right. But those, if I could go back, you know, I would tell that to myself, you know, understand that they are coming from a place of care in most scenarios. Yeah. And um, it is really hard to maintain your patience when, mm. you know, there, there's a difference between your leaving Islam, having an impact on you largely or how you're going to take and then being offended for you leaving the ideology yeah. versus their criticism coming from not you following another ideology, but rejecting theirs and criticizing you as a person for doing that. Right, right. And and actually, like, we, like, just one of the things just to go not too off topic here, but, you know, when, when, even in my case, when they found out that, oh, you left Islam, you're, you're not going to teach your children Islam. So then, you know, it goes from that to like, oh, so are you just going to let them wear short skirts and just do this and do that now? Like, are they just going to be, you know, promiscuous walking into my house now? And it's kind of like, those were those moments where I was kind of like, deep breath, you know, one does not lead to the other, you know, you haven't lost all notion of morale, of respect, or, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? It's just, you know, I'm going to take a different approach, use a different moral value system. This is what it is. Right. And that's where I think it's uh, and I never I took the opportunity away from myself, really, to communicate that with them. Like, hey, you know, if you just replace this Islamic moral value system with maybe a concept of humanism. Right. And you teach your children how to be this way, that way, blah, blah, blah. Right. Then you don't really have to worry about whether they're going to, you know, not respect your, you know, values when they walk into your house. You know, they'll be good kids, right? And if that's what you consider to be immoral when they're in your house, they'll abide by those things. They're not causing any harm and, you know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or you, I mean, everybody wants that people come to their home, be respectful of their home, like don't wear shoes in the house or whatnot. Yeah. And my approach has always been if I'm not accepted the way I am, like th there are things I would do, like if you're like, hey, don't drink in my house. I'm not going to drink in your house. Like, I'm not right. going to do that. They're, right? they're, they're benign things. Yeah. But if somebody told me you need to wear a hijab if you're in my house and I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. And, and I think and I think as adults, we have the liberty to say no, because um, it can be hard. I mean, it can be hard for many people. But I think because we live in the West or maybe because our parents are a bit more liberal and have raised us, um, mm to be assertive in some way, or I think we built being assertive, you know, in over time because of how much criticism we've gotten and how right. push, how pushover we could have been as well. Yeah. Um, without derailing, uh, somebody did ask, um, how are you co-parenting with a mother who's Muslim? I wanted to clarify this over chat, but I thought it might be good for you to kind of talk a bit more about your partner. Oh, sure. Yeah. So my wife, um, she is she is now ex-Muslim as well. She is also a non-believer um, in any god, right? So she's an atheist. She's not she's not very vocal about it. She just yeah, I no longer accept Islam. I raise my we, we raise our kids together with more or less the same moral value system, which is sentientism, humanism type of thing. She's vegan, so for her it'll be sentientism. Um, but yeah, no, she's not she's not Muslim. Um, the rest of her family is, so she's actually had some pretty much more traumatizing um encounters with you know deconstructing her religion and her moral value system and all that but she's not very active and all that kind of stuff i'm more the active one yeah um i wanted to kind of go into the question i asked previously and this might extend to a few other questions as well um Thinking about early age of teaching your kids what is good what is bad if we had to kind of you know, go back in history and think about the times we were taught what is good, what is bad. And I'm assuming that we may have had similar or overlapping upbringings, mm -hmm. um, like many Muslims. Um, a lot of what is good and what is bad, do not do this, do not do that, comes from that fear of hell. Or right. like don't, or, or the fear of parents. 
Right. You know, you, you teach, you, you scare your kids and they end up lying to you mm-hmm. because you don't actually tell them why they shouldn't be doing. And, and of course, we'll have kids who will rebel because they have their own minds. Right. Um, so how, how, how did you, especially in your early years, um, so thinking about when your older daughter was born and, you know, I don't know if that's an approach that you did initially take and then had to change it or if you always took the approach of, um, don't do this because it is not nice because I think there's a cultural issue here and then there's a religious issue here as well. Right, right. So when I, so let's, okay, so some, the, the way I raised, the, the way I started out raising my older child is very different than I st- the way I started raising my younger child, right? Because I was still deconstructing um, when I had, when the older child was, you know, just in her ones and twos type of thing. And so for the first child, I, 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 I was kind of like, you know, don't do this because I said so, right? The whole like, you know, fear, like not, not, I don't want, nobody wants their kids to fear you, right? But kind of like, hey, if you don't do this, you're going to get in trouble. It's essentially the same thing, right? And as I went on in my journey and realized that, you know, like I myself, don't like that approach, right? Like, don't do this because you're going to burn in hell, right? Obviously, I can't teach even a childish version of that to my child. That doesn't make any sense, right? So it's kind of like I had to re reassess and reframe a lot of the thing, the way I t- explained how to, why not to do things or why to do things, you know, do things because this is a good thing to do. Right. So explain it from you, you want to do good to help others. You want to do good to help yourself. Right. And you want to do good for the sake of doing good, not for any reward. Right. Or not to not not to you don't want to do good to avoid punishment. Right. So I I was in that transition phase when I had the first child and I, I, I'm, I'm she was only two. So I like it's not like I, I well, I don't know whether she was confused or not type of thing. Right. But I, I always went in it with, I don't want my kids to be afraid of me. That was my baseline, right? So I, I don't want my kids to be like, hey, if I don't listen to dad, if I don't do this, or if I don't listen to papa, I'm going to get in trouble, right? Like, so I'm going to do this instead, right? Like that, I don't want them to, you know, um, from something as kind of simple as like, you know, eat your food because it's good for you and you need the energy to do this and this and all the playing that you want to do and blah, 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 and get a good night's sleep so you can, you know, rinse and repeat. Not, hey, eat your food or else you're going to get in trouble, right? That's something, you know, a, a compare and contrast and how, you know, the things you would tell a baby, right? And I know like some parents do it, do it that way. Hey, if you don't eat your trouble, I'm going to take away your iPad. If you, or if you don't, if you don't eat your food, I'm you're you're going to get in trouble or something like that. Or um, me, I just try as much as I can to take the approach. Well, hey, eat your food because you need the energy. And if you want to do the things that you want to do, which is play after, you're going to need the energy. So it's in your best interest to eat your food. And sometimes my wife looks at me and she's like, why do you explain things in so much detail? Right? Like it is a lot easier to just be like, yo, eat your food. You're going to get in trouble straight up. Right. But I, I, we were like, we were raised that way. And I never responded positively to that. Right. And most kids in our generation, even the ones that remain in Islam, they don't respond well to that type of reinforcement. So, you know, if I want my kid, if I want my kids to, to respect me and love me, not respect me and fear me, I have to take a different approach and I want to take a different approach because I know it didn't work for me. So why would I think it will work for them? Yeah. And I guess just in, in that context, um, does that, did that differ from, obviously you have, I would imagine good relationship with your families where your kids go to their grandparents. Do you think that, and and grandparents obviously have this innate need to parent your child, not in, not out of malicious intent, but out of, Hey, I'm also part of, um, creating this sense of, uh, I, I also have a sense of duty towards my grandchild to make sure they're good people as yeah. well. 
But do you think that, um, or have you been in a position where your parents might have um, said something like, oh, you might go to hell or, and, and unintentionally, like still trying to respect your boundaries, but I can imagine how innate it is. Cause like my sisters still do it to me. They're like, you're going to go to hell. And I'm like, okay, really? <laughs> I'm an oh. adult. I'm not a child. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I think, I think I, like, my, my parents never really said that to me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but like all parents, they get a little more religious as they get older. So I, I don't know mm -hmm. whether they say that now. Had I not put up those boundaries mm -hmm. um, when my kids were born to say, hey, there's there's no talk about religion. There's no reference to Islam. There's no God talk. There's nothing. You know, if you want them to eat your food, if they want them to eat their food in your house, you're going to come up with another way other than, hey, if you don't eat your food, you're going to burn in hell, right? Like, so thankfully, my kids have never had to experience that. Um, but my parents, my parents know better than, like, they never even did that with me. Right? Yeah. But I guess I am. I'm, I'm fortunate in that sense. Do you, do you feel like, particularly with your situation, how you were raised and your family dynamics, that you were at a particular advantage? Because... I imagine um, having kids has a lot to do with the families you have, the people they have around them to trust and um, the trust you would place on your families as well. Like when you need a babysitter or when you just need a night out and you obviously want your kids to feel comfortable around their grandparents as well. They're... Yeah, I'm definitely lucky. There, are, like, there have been some things where I'm kind of like, mom, dad, meh, you know, like that doesn't make any sense. You know, don't do that. Right. Like a good example of that, which is nothing even to do with Islam, but it still is kind of like eh, maybe kind of you can kind of relate it back. Right. You know, like um, they have this notion, which most parents do in kind of like fate or destiny, you know, like your destiny is written. Right. Or your child, you know, and obviously that would apply to the child as well. Right. So, you know, if, if harm is not meant to uh, befall them, then nothing will happen. Right. So one of the weird things that happened was um, it's one of those things, I guess, um, when a child is, I think, younger than two or whatever, you're not supposed to give them honey. Right. Like pure raw honey. Right. Mm -hmm. And when they would get sick, it's a common remedy to give your child honey. It has been for for probably centuries. Right. I don't know. Maybe it's the way they process it now. I don't know what what the science is behind that. Right. But it's on the label you know, do not give children under the age of two honey, right? And there, there is science behind it, right? So, you know, kids are sick, they're there and give them honey, give them honey. We're like, no, no, we don't give them honey. Give them, you know, you know, infant Tylenol or something or whatever, right? And um, they would kind of, they'd kind of slip, slip some honey, you know? And I'm kind of like, mom, dad, no honey, Right. Please don't do that. Right. At this point, I never showed them the label. I'm just like, please don't do that. We don't want to give the child honey. You know, A, they're vegan. Right. And B, you know, it's not good for them at such a young age. And then again, next time, more honey. And I'm like, OK, maybe they forgot, you know, hey, no honey. OK. Third time, fourth time, fifth time. I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? Why is this honey thing an issue? Why is this why is this a thing? So I actually had honey and I'm like, here, here's the label. This is where it says it. Right. And it, it goes back to that whole thing where, you know, oh, if, if something's meant to happen to your child, it'll happen. If something's not meant to happen to your child, no matter what I do or what I give them, nothing's gonna happen to your child. They're fine. And I'm like, no, no stop giving them honey. Right? Because we don't believe in that fate stuff. And it says on the label, no honey. So, hey, no honey, right? Yeah. But that was... Um, but it's, it's really interesting. I, I mean, I, I can see where they're coming from when your child outsmarts you, you know, because like you you raised, you were raised fine. We gave you honey, you didn't die. Right. So I can, I can see that they're like, oh, do you think you're smarter than us? Like, you're and the reality is, the reality is that future generations are a bit more well learned because we have technology at the... Uh, well, you know, at the tips of our, at our yeah. fingertips. So we have yeah. the advantage to know a bit more and also science has also adv advanced quite a bit. So. Right. And the ease yeah. of access to that information, right? Exactly. Like, I'm just, you know, pseudoscience everywhere, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you can, you can go and be like, okay, why is honey bad for a child? You can Google that and you'll get a, a gajillion articles on, on that. Right. 
which they never had access to. That's all they knew because their parents did. That's what they did. That's what they did. Right. But we have access to more information now so we could utilize that. Problem is they don't like, you know, typical, very typical of that of older generations. They don't like being proven wrong, even by scientists, you know. Yeah. They're like, oh, this is new studies. Yeah, yeah. we did it. We were fine. And it was Chinese whispers at their time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So I guess my next question goes into a bit more of a deeper topic. Um, We're going to talk about schooling for your children, Mm. Um, them being around other children who are Muslims, um, them being in school during Ramadan. I know I'm aware your children are quite young. So, you know, the peer pressure can be a bit a little less, but nonetheless, but also around, I guess, you know, them coming home to you and asking you questions about, yeah. hey, we were taught this in school and I've never been taught this. Or, you know, if their teachers are religious, you know, they might bring up something. I guess yeah. in my example was we were never taught, we were never taught evolution. So when the teacher did teach evolution, she's like, but God created all of us. So it's 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 not real, but yeah. it was in but- the curriculum so we had to teach you. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, so even, the, I so I was kind of unprepared for so one day my 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 older one she's now seven so this happened when she was six so she was in grade one um i you know like i teach them about islam and you know to you know respect the customs of you know because all of all the family around her is, is more or less muslim right so she she it she does know what islam is she does know what muslim means and all that kind of stuff she doesn't know what god is and all that kind of stuff or what people make God out to be and all that. She, she is. So she's aware of that. She's not completely naive about that. But one day she comes home and she's just like, Oh, Papa, guess what? We guess what I talked about with my friends today. I was like, Oh, what? And she's like, Oh, so they said that, did you know that God made you and me? And I was like, no way. Right. Like, it's just not what you think a six year old bunch of six year olds would talk about. Right. And I was like, well, no way. What did you say? And she's like, um, what she said? Oh, she's like, well, God didn't. God might have made you, but God didn't make me. Mommy and Daddy made me. I came from evolution, and I was like, well, <laughs> way to go, kid! Like, you know, like way to stand your ground, right? And but yeah, so I, I guess, and and I mean, we're you know, we have our kids in the public system, not a Catholic school, which they do have here in in Canada, right? They're in the public school system, so they it, and it is they they, they celebrate. So they'll celebrate eat at school. They'll do a little arts and craft and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, for Visaki or Diwali or Christmas, even whatever, right. They'll do like little arts and crafts and stuff. Right. So make it inclusive. Right. But it's more apart from that, it's more or less secular. So, right. Obviously they're young. They're not learning in science. They're not learning about evolution and all that kind of stuff or whatever. Right. But um, they just had that conversation just, whatever I recess. So I was kind of like, Oh, wow, that's a, okay. That, that was a curveball. I wasn't ready for that conversation, but I'm really proud of the way my kid handled that. And um, I, I, I can only assume that's because in our household, they know that I'm kind of a sciencey person. And I'm always like, Hey, let's, you know, what'd you learn in science class today? Like, did you know about this? Did you know this? Did you know this? Did you know that? I'm always kind of like putting little things in their head about like, Hey, did you know this discovery was just made? Or did you know, do you know why ice is this and water is that and whatever, whatever, right? And do you know, you know, of what evolution teaches and all, you know, we accept science and therefore we accept evolution and here's the evidence. And, you know, so I'm always like, you know, they have little kid books that explain evolution and like the, the origin of the universe and all that kind of stuff. So they're very much made aware of these kind of concepts. So when I was so proud that, hey, like I, I hear I'm thinking these are just kind of bedtime stories and kind of ways to connect with your child, but then your six-year-old goes to school, here's another kid saying, hey, did you know God made you? And they're like, mm, no, maybe they made you, if that's what you want to think. But I was, you know, mommy and daddy made me, and we came from evolution. And I was kind of like, yay. When? Yeah. How do you suppose she came to challenging that? Because it is part of critically thinking, you know, just the fact that you're like, god may may have made you that is a massive step for somebody very young to have yeah Uh, uh, so the way i kind of framed the god thing um with with my older child especially just 
by virtue of the fact that she's older and she has a higher capacity for learning at this point than the younger one is I was like, you know, explaining that, you know, both parents are Muslim. They believe in God. And but I explained to her that, you know, they believe in God because of, you know, because of a feeling that they have. And they believe that there's this book, it's called the Quran, and they use that as evidence for God and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I've always taught them that, hey, you know, like, we accept science because science is measurable, it's predictable, it makes predictions, and, you know, it's a method. It's a method, and it's a better method to distinguish truth from falsities than, you know, this person, you know, said so. Like, it's essentially blind faith, right? Like, I tried to tell them, don't believe anything on blind faith. Ask questions. You know, that includes to me. Like, don't just take what I say for face value, right? Be skeptical of, of my claims as well. But the difference is, is that I can go with you and tell you, um, even explaining it to a child, like, this is why we say evolution is factual. And this, these are, and, you know, you can go on the internet and be like, hey, look, there, there that's it. That's that's the skull of a Neanderthal and the other skull is shaped differently. And these are the other ones and these are the other ones, or, you know, you can go and talk about planets or whatever. Right. So through going through the methodology, the scientific method with them and showing them the evidence, right. Um, as I just thought it's a really fun activity because I'm really like, Ooh, science. Right. But for them, they're really, pro I, I, I guess for my kids example, um, instance, sorry, she really is processing it seems how to come to conclusions properly. And then when someone makes a claim, like, did you know God made you? She's like, well, her natural instinct, because maybe she didn't see the evidence is I'm going to be skeptical of that claim because that's what I've taught her to be, regardless of who makes the claim and just say, well, there's better evidence on this side. So this is what I guess I believe. Right. Because I, I try not to indoctrinate my child blindly the other way, right? Like, don't don't trust science because it's science. You know, there's good science and there's bad science, right? There's, like, properly done science and not properly done science. And, you know, science, when it's not properly done, doesn't mean it's factual, right? So I, I do tell I do tell these things to a six-year-old. And some people may be like, well, that's, I'm not, like, that's too advanced for a six-year-old. But if you explain it ch child appropriately, in our, in our case, it did, it did, have our child confident enough to stand up to her peer and be like, no, I, I don't believe that. I, I accept the science and I accept evolution. Right. So you kind of, you give them the tools, you, I guess in my sense, you just give them the, the, the evidence you show them on Google and the pictures and stuff like that and the planets and big bang and read them books and all that kind of stuff. And the, the, and then you kind of hope that they can take that out into the world when they're older and make use of it. In my case, I was really, it was really cool to see that, wow, at such a young age, she was able to reason with information and um, come to her own conclusion, you know, by herself and stand her ground and stand her ground, not just say nothing, you know? What are some instances that that approach may have backfired? And in this case, I'm thinking this is a child who has learned or is learning to question everything. So I can imagine that even the things that you perceive to be true, like any good science, for instance, how has that backfired? Because so those are like the experiences a lot of people would uh, yeah. really struggle with then going like, how is this? Like, how are you challenging the right authority or right. the right uh, knowledge here? So I, I like people look at me and they're like, you just you opened up a bag or can of worms that you're not ready for ready for and and it it's not that i'm not ready for like a lot of people just don't have the patience for it right they they, they just because they're working they have this they have that they have they don't have the time to just sit down and actually explain to your explain to their kids right so they're just like you know it's just easier if you see me as a person of authority and just listen to what i say and just do it right whereas i just because the way i was raised was that way right because my my parents were both hustling to make a living right they didn't have time to answer my questions and right especially with stuff that they were they didn't care about right but with me i really went out of my way sometimes inconvenient most of the time inconveniently to no slow down sit down explain this to your kid 
right? And so it's backfired just with not even science, parenting rules in general, right down to, hey, eat your food, right? And we're, you know, like eat your food quickly because we have to go somewhere and we're on a time schedule or something, right? And then, they, you know, they're not eating their food or they're asking like, why do I have to eat this? I ate this yesterday. And in your head, you're like, just eat the food. We got to go, right? But I am the type of person and I think it's it's always better to be the type of person that's like, okay, you got to eat your food because da 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 da. If you're not got energy to do the fun stuff that we want to do, so the quicker you eat your food, the faster we can go to that trampoline park, and then you can go nuts and have energy to go nuts, right? So, uh, and a lot of a lot of my, a lot of my friends, a lot of my family, even they look at me and they're just like, why, why? Just tell them to eat their food, right? But I just I I don't want to do it that way. I really don't want to do it that way. Even though it's 99% of the time, it's so much easier to do it that way, right? But I just, I just, I go out of my way to not be like that. Yeah. Do, do you feel like that's because you're that parent type and then your partner is, um, I guess you balance your partner out. So that's the role you play. Yeah. So sometimes she's like, side, you, you got two minutes. Explain, but you have, you have two minutes, <laughs> right? And she's like, then we got to go, right? And I'm like, all right, two minutes. And then, you know, go right but so but yeah so she is de she's definitely with the more hustle she's just like eat your food because i said eat your food right not that she doesn't explain things to her kids but she's she's always more like like let's go let's go type of person right and i have such a bad concept of oh fun. i've i've heard you make a speech when we had a tequila party i've, I've been oh. there <laughs> <laughs> um Flond Infidel um, oh. has asked whether you were, whether you read, used uh, any non-religious parenting books. Many of them are from an ex-Christian perspective, but I imagine I, there is. I actually haven't. So um, if you have any recommendations, please send them my way. I actually never read any parenting books, to be honest, because I, 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 at, the, at the time that I was like, we were having kids. I was just like, there is probably no book about raising kids when you're deconstructing your religion and all. Like it was in my head, I was like, wow, I, I felt so alone and so like I just got to figure this out for myself. So I never, I never, I never looked at any like parenting books because I was just like, I, I feel like it's like you always get those you know, ones on Instagram, like you know, hey, like recommendations and stuff like that, right? You know. But I was just like, this is probably not going to relate to my situation. So I got other things I got to do. Right. But if, yeah, if you, if you can recommend any, that would be super helpful. Put them in the comments. I'd love them. Yeah, that would be great. I could create like a reel of like books and I feel like, or, or I could put it on the website because we're creating a lot of support articles Yeah, and it would be nice super to helpful. have other people. I, I don't think there's nearly enough ex-Muslim stuff. And while there's so much we have um, overlapping with ex-Christian, I feel like there, there, like I said before, there's religious like restrictions with Islam particularly, but then there's also a cultural tie which binds you to the religion as well. And yeah. which moves me really well to the next topic, which I think is very important, cultural identity and mm -hmm. how you create a sense of cultural identity within your kid, like with your kids and your family environment and also be able to reject part of your, part of the culture because as it is known that you know a lot of our cultures like our ancestors you being from was it Guyanese you're Guyanese yeah. right yeah, yeah. yeah um and then and like you know for me my cultural identity was completely stripped away because we've been in Tanzania for generations but then we've also been Muslims and we've also been ethnic minorities in Tanzania so you know, if I had to go back to my ancestors, which would be like Afghan and Western India, that yeah. that would all be a lot about dance and like um, not not Diwali. What is it called? Um, they have a they they have like a dandia, yeah, dandia. So it's a lot about oh. dance and culture, but all of that was stripped away from, you know, what would have been my ancestors' culture, or even before yeah. that, who knows. Yeah. That that could go a long line, but because our cultures are quite tied in with being a Muslim, now I understand that you grew up quite liberal, but there has to be like, you know, Eid being one of them or dresses or how you dress up. I think mm -hmm. it's really tied and especially having girls as well. It becomes an even important question because now 
Like if you were a new parent, you'd be really surprised if your parents ever said that maybe they should not wear anything, you know, that is shorter than the knee. Yeah, yeah. So I'll tell you. So this was a really hard question to answer, right? Because uh, not not so much from my perspective, right? Because um, like I'm Guyanese, we were raised like I was I was born in Canada, right? But then I realized that like uh, one of the big problems with Canada, and a lot of people say this, is kind of like a lot of people in our generation, regardless of where we come, from, we're kind of like what what culture at, at like as Canadians do we have, right? Like like everyone has just fallen off the cliff in terms of, you know, um, kind of maintaining that culture, that cultural identity from their ancestors. That's a problem that Canada as a country has, regardless of your ethnicity, right? And then the other challenge is that my wife, although being born in Canada, my wife is, is Pakistani. And there is, like, as, you know, some, I guess some people are aware, right, that in Pakistani culture, it's so hard to distinguish what is culture and what is religion, right? So it's kind of like, as we were raising our kids and we're like, hey, this, like, if we were just like put aside, because obviously we're, we're raising them non-religious, right? Like, so, but from a, say like Pakistani, but non-Islamic perspective, it's really, okay, that you have the dress, right? Like the, the cool, like the, the outfits and stuff like that, right? You have the music, right? Which is spectacular. You have the food, which is spectacular, right? Um, and we have, we, like, we've, we've brought that along, right? And we, we encourage all of that. Like when we, like me and my wife, we, we suck at cooking. So we, we were fortunate to live in a, in a city where there's like easy access to Indian food. So they, they get a taste of their, that culture all the time, right? But there are other there are other many parts of the of the Pakistani and, and to some extent Guyanese culture as well, where you know um, women are just you know they, they they get to take their food out after the men, right? There are certain practices that are inherent in the culture that you're kind of like, okay, it does have an Islamic um, like the root cause of it is Islam, right? But it's more so let's just say like it falls into the uh, into the category of like um patriarchy let's just say right so those things where you know in a group of men a woman shouldn't really come around and voice her opinion on a topic that men are discussing right those are things where and sometimes when we go over to family's house that's still that's still kind of a of a dynamic right and then um, you know, certain family get togethers will go to like extended family. And, you know, the men are still segregated from the men are segregated from the women. And, you know, my daughters would want to ask me something or whatever, but they can't come over to the men's side and ask. Right. And they'll have all these questions. We confused, Right. So obviously we don't bring that forward. Right. But when they get exposed to that, you know, we do, Sometimes, sometimes not in the moment because you don't want to offend anyone or anyone over here, right? Because, you know, not all the family knows that we're non-believers and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the occasion may not be appropriate to be like, hey, let's create a stage and profess our non-belief, right? Um, so we just say, hey, like, just do this for now and we'll explain to you when we get home, right? Like to our kids, right? And then when we explain it, we're kind of like, hey, you know, like, it's a good thing that we don't do this anymore, right? It's a good thing that we don't do this in this family because men and women are equals, right? So there's no such thing you can, you know, when you're with, when you're around us, you know, you don't have to, or around the other side of the family or whatever, you know, you can just go take your food. You don't have to wait until every man has taken their food and then go take your food. If you're hungry, go eat, grab a plate. You know what I mean? So there are certain things that they are exposed to and we do have to, um, we do have to address them because it's, it, it is really in their face, right? Like, why, why am I not allowed to go take a plate of food type of thing, right? But we do have to um, try our best to, you know, bring the culture forward, leave the religion behind and leave those patriarchal ideas, those misogynistic ideals behind. And it is challenging because a lot of Pakistani culture is kind of weaved in with those kind of belief systems, right? Um, I think 
one of the things that was most affected apart from this was their veganism. So Pakistani culture, South American, Guyanese, Trinidadian culture is very meat centric. Like there's, there's meat in every dish. There's no questions asked. Right. And because they're vegan, I'm vegetarian now, but they're uh, both two kids and wife are vegan. And holy damn, did that create like a, like, what do you mean you don't eat meat? Are, are you guys nuts? Where do you get your protein from? You know? So that was one of those things where <clears throat> like in terms of cultural identity and conflict, that was probably the biggest one is their veganism. But I understand that doesn't apply. That applies to a very small percentage of people. Right. But you can only imagine because there's probably a lot of Pakistanis watching this where meat is in like every dish. And if you say you don't eat meat, it's kind of like it's almost as bad as saying you don't believe in God. Like, literally. yes. Right. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not Pakistani, but African food is like that as well. Yeah. And we don't have like they look a lot at, of vegetables. Yeah. yeah. They look at you like you're equally crazy. Yeah. I think in Tanzania, like vegetarian or having meat is kind of correlated with you being able to afford meat. Oh, so okay, okay. Veg vegetarian food would be more familiar to people who couldn't. Right. And meat would be a luxury. So that's that's yeah. how when when my I, I came from a not very wealthy family at all when I was young. Yeah. Um and my mom used to tell me this. They're like, we would only make chicken if we had guests because you can't oh. serve vegetables then. Right. Yeah. Because, yeah. Because, yeah. So in, in, in South in Guyana, at least with our family, um, that was kind of the case. Like you would have chicken and stuff like that, but beef, beef was the like the like you know, your, your high class type of thing. You save that for special occasions type of thing because it's definitely more expensive. And we, my parents grew up uh, like very poor, just like yours. Um, in Pakistan, however, as I get to understand, you could pretty much not afford to pay your bills, but you're having meat every day. Like mm. it was so easily accessible. It's staple food. It, yeah. It, and it was so cheap apparently that they would just have veal and stuff. And what, even in Canada, we'd be like, wow, that's pretty exotic. Like they would, they would have that stuff all the time. It'll be a street. It'll be like street. It'll be like street food. Right. Yeah. Um. So one of the. So I know we've talked a lot about you know extended families and people outside and respecting your boundaries, but also putting up boundaries and creating mm -hmm. bridges where necessary. I think the last question that I would think is quite important is. How do you envision your relationship with your kids in the future if they decide to follow a path? Because if they decide to follow a more religious path or uh, or a path that involves believing in God. Right. And yeah, I, I, I think that, that that is one of the scary thoughts that, you know, you're like, if I'm not a Muslim and I've left, like you, you're not just raised, you're not, you're not. Not you're not raised as an atheist. You're right. raised as a Muslim, so you've made the deconversion. Mm -hmm. And you know, in in your opinion, it is the best thing possible because you're not following a lot of misogynistic, um, homophobic ideas. However, people do find their own meaning in Islam, and I think we discussed it in the why I left uh, the the why ex Muslim video. Right, so, how right. would you navigate that conversation or? It, it, how would you be able to reconcile even with yourself that this is my child's choice and right. kind of reversing what you have kind of, you know, built onto them to carry forward? Yeah. So just like you, like, I'd be lying if I'd say I wasn't disappointed if my if my kid grew up in her teenagers and in her teen years and was just like, hey, like, you know, Allah's the best. Right. I'd be like, oh, shit. Like in my head. Right. Like, in my head, I'm kind of like, please Sufi and not Salafi. Like, oh, my God. Right? But I think the best thing, and this is this is one of those reasons where I'm like, I got to take the time and slow down and explain to my kids. because And it, part of it's out of that. Because you want to make intellectual and moral progress and pass that on to your child so they can make intellectual and moral progress above and beyond what you've made. Right? Like, that's, that's kind of the progress cycle, right? Like, or you hope for, right? So... Like, I think it, it, your journey is your journey, right? This is, the, this is what I tell myself, right? Like, my journey is my journey. I'm teaching my kids as I'm learning, right? Obviously, age-appropriate, blah, 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 right? Um, but 
it's for that reason that I strongly believe that it is important to, to just slow down and really set the foundations for your child and teach them how to reason, how to, how, you know, like, like really make empathy and compassion and acceptance and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, um, I don't remember the word. Um, tolerance, sorry, tolerance, right? How to make those really intrinsic in their personality, right? Um, so when they grow up, they'll have the tools. So if they're presented with another, you know, let's just say there's some Dawa person or they, their best friend is Muslim or whatever, and they start asking questions like, hey, why do you do what you do? And blah, blah, blah. The way I was taught Islam is totally different. What do you mean God is love, right? Type of thing like they'll be able to have the tools to know how to make informed decisions. And you, you could only hope that your kid will make moral and intellectual progress. Like by that, I mean like my journey is my journey and I can help my child along. Like my, my kids know that I'm, I'm an activist. They know that I'm, you know, I consider myself pretty scientifically literate and all that. And I, they know the things that I value. I value evidence. I value conversation and I value, you know, all those kind of things. Right. So I only hope that when they grow up, they also value those kind of things and in valuing those things, they'll be able to assess information and distinguish good from like better from not good type of thing. Right. Like this is a better set of moral values. That's a not, you know, that's a worse set of moral values, whatever. And, but I think it's really important for as parents, as progressive parents, as parents that understand what it's like to not be accepted for who you are, right? Some of us have been ostracized from our own family. Some of us have our own now after probably decades of conflict, rebuilding those bridges with our own families. We know what it's like to like have your parents disappointed in you because you left Islam disappointed you because you became a vegan or something or, or what have you. So you don't want, you don't want to have that relationship with your child regardless, well, granted they're not criminals and stuff, but like, you know, if they, if, if all of a sudden they want to sit there and be like, come home from high school one day and be like, Hey, did you know, did you know that rose quartz is realigning my, it can realign my energy or, you know, like, Oh, I'm pissy with mommy because you know, mercury went retrograde or something. If they come back and like, say something like that. I'm like, okay, let's, let's, let's assess the evidence. Like what's your, what's your proof, you know, and you know, let's go from there. Right. So I hope those values stay with them. And, you know, just the way I take the time and explain things to my kids now, when they're super young, I don't see any reason why that has to change as they get older. Right. And, you know, you know, that, that whole thing where, all we have is conversation, right? To distinguish a good idea from a bad idea. All, the only tool we have is conversation and evidence. At least that's what I believe, right? And as long as they're not hurting people, if they want to believe God is love, but and they're still doing service to the world in a positive way, they're still, you know, they can believe what they want to believe, but they're still making moral and intellectual progress in the world and with themselves then who am I to tell them that they can't do that or can't believe that, right? And I think it's important for, it's been important for me to understand that my journey is my journey. I'm an activist. I'm an atheist. I'm an anti-theist. I'm, I'm, you know, I found my purpose and found my meaning in life. And I can only hope that I've give them the, given my kids the tools through my example to so they can leave moral and intellectually progressive lives, but their journey is their journey. You know, I have no control over their destination, right? But they, like, like where their journey takes them is not for me to determine, right? It's for them to discover, if that makes any sense. Right. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I have a couple of questions for you from the audience. Yeah, um, sure. So, Vail Royce has asked, um, how should ex-Muslim parents help their children deal with the kafirphobia? 
and by they by this i understand mm. that um they they can at some point become targets or be excluded from groups or you know face bigotry like anybody else would but especially in the context of not being muslims or even having or even some people getting to know their background of their parents or their grandparents being muslims um Yeah, I I personally like when I'm on Ubers and you know people know my name and they're like, oh, are you Muslim? And I'm like, no, no, my parents are. I'm not. And they're like, why? And I'm like, I'm just not. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, so like I said in the very beginning, like I, by no means, claim to be a specialist in any of this, right? But there are people, there are resources that. Are that that have qualified people speaking on these topics, writing about these topics. There's a lot of articles online. Um, Faithless Hijabi, for instance, has a resource page where you can link to other organizations. Right, I believe that's in development right now, where they they have qualified therapists, they have people that have that are um, psychologists and all that kind of stuff that can really dive into. Um, qualitative answers with this right but in my experience through my kind of just you know very unqualified opinion right and just personal experience like finding a community of like-minded individuals very important very important and there's a lot of support communities around the world for ex-muslims and a lot of those ex-muslims members of those communities have kids so you know if If you're even if you're closeted and, you know, there's a lot of communities um, where I am, ex-Muslims of Toronto is one of them. And we have get togethers, we have meetups and we bring the kids and the kids can play and other parents talk to other parents and ask them, hey, how did you do this? What like have you gone through this before? Right. And it's a great way to build community. It's a great way to kind of. um realize that those who are kafir phobic right as that person put it um just like a lot of muslims are they, muslims don't represent islam majority of them right um a lot of kafirs right like we, they have completely different like there's a whole spectrum of worldviews in this thing right so aligning yourselves in a community or at least having a community or a group of friends that understand your point of view and understand what you're going through or at least having someone that you can communicate wholeheartedly with what you're going through is so so beneficial so beneficial and i'm so glad that there are these communities right that have sprung up from seemingly out of nowhere because there are so many people, there's more and more people all the time that have these, have these questions and there is a huge support group, right? You just have to find, you have to find it, reach out, reach out because we can point you in the right direction. Yeah. I think, I think the point on support group is kind of uh, valued into how we, um, how we grow as a person as well. We want to be around people who share va our values and around communities that respect us versus degrade us. Mm -hmm. And obviously the online world doesn't do justice to keeping your mental health sane. Not but at all. I and think sometimes it is. Sometimes your family doesn't either. Like sometimes exactly. your, your family is, is the one that's causing you all the grief and all the stress, right? So looking looking for those communities, right? Even if you're closeted, Super helpful, super helpful. Yeah. Um, Blonde Infidel has asked, um, have you given any thought to how to thought on how you would talk to your daughters about modesty, especially as they get older? I have thought. Um, of, yeah. Um, so this it's, it's interesting. So my wife, like my wife is still deconstructing those um, concepts like modesty culture and all that that are very intrinsic into very intrinsic in Pakistani culture. Um, but I, I guess because I wasn't immersed in Pakistani culture at all, so I don't have those challenges. So I, you know, 
there's a I've thought about this and I could be wrong. And if there is further insight that people can offer, please put it in the comments. I love them. Right. Um, but I've kind of so far come at it from a place where, okay, if, if my kid's 12, whatever, and she wears shorts and she goes to the mall and someone comments that, Hey, why is your child dressing inappropriately? Or why are you, you know, blah, 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 parading your child like that or whatever. Right. Like I've really just, come to the conclusion that if you if you're objectifying a, a 12 year old you're sick in the head you know if you're sexualizing the body of a 12 year old you're sick in the head my kid can go to the mall and wear shorts no damn problem right like you're the issue not my kid right and with that though like then the you know online you get the whole thing where it's like oh so if your kid wears a bikini and goes to the mall you're totally fine with it right because you have no morals wrong there's also, you know, a gauge of appropriateness. You're not going to wear a bikini and go walk at the mall. However, if you wear a bikini, my kid wants to wear a bikini and go to the beach, I'm not going to have an issue with it because it's okay, like, what's the word? Occasion appropriate, I guess, whatever that word is, right? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of navigating all that, right? But I, 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 I think I'm firm in that, you know what, like, if someone's going to, if some old dude's ogling, you know, my daughter, right? I'm going to have words with him, obviously. But explain to him that, yo, like, you're the problem, not my daughter. You know what I mean? And I teach my daughter that too, even at this age, right? And we do have, um, because we're so immersed in the Pakistani culture, so I really have to be like, you know, um, just rambling, going off topic for a second with the Pakistani. So when my kids wear, um, like, show kameez, which is like the typical Pakistani outfit, my kids have just grown to call it respect clothes. It's funny, but it's something that I have to deconstruct now because you don't have to cover your whole body, even minus the hijab. You don't have to cover your whole body in order to come to, to feel like you're being respectful. So that's one of those things where it's like um, at, at some point I, or another, I don't really know where that went off the rails but that's something where it's like wait well, hey like we're clearly not perfect we're still we're still learning this kind of stuff and it is my my responsibility as a father a progressive father but but also an activist like if this was any other child i'd, I'd do the same thing where explain to the child just how i have to explain to adults seemingly that a woman's worth or a girl's worth is not determined by how much of her body is covered or not covered Right. And I, I, and I, I do. And I, I, and I will continue to reinforce that to my seven year old. Right. To know that, hey, OK, yeah, that seven year old wears hijab. You don't wear hijab. She's not allowed to wear shorts to go visit her cousins. You are allowed to wear shorts to visit her cousins. It has nothing to do with whether you're respectful or not respectful or what have you. Yeah. And um, I think. I think the only close example I could think of was when we were at Hyde Park and um, a convert Nikabi woman told off a former friend of mine for showing her cleavage. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm sorry, but I'm not here talking, you know, I'm here to discuss ideas. I don't come up to you and ask you why you're wearing this because it offends me. Right. Yeah. Um, and what was really interesting was a Turkish guy actually opposed her and defended me. Oh. And his daughter was wearing shorts. And I'm like, oh, I asked him, like, are you Muslim? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, it's really interesting that your daughter's wearing short. And I wasn't being condescending. I actually was being very inquisitive. And he, and he said that, well, she can wear whatever she wants. It's not... It's, she's not responsible for how other people react. Exactly. That's her life. She has to make the decisions. Right. I will teach her to protect herself. And I thought that was very unique and admirable. Yeah. For, I, like, I, and obviously, to a lot of Turkish people that I've met are quite mostly agnostic or like yeah. very open minded. Liberal. Yeah, they're very liberal. Like, yeah. You know. Very, yeah. Very right. open-minded. I thought, like, for a Muslim man, not just a Muslim, like a Muslim man and a father to say that must have come from an area where he he knows, you know, what yeah. the real world is like. Was he, like, um, average or was he, like, older, clearly older? 
I would say it was about 40, 40 something, because the daughter were like teenagers. So, oh, so like he was like a, one generation older than us, even. Yeah. Right. Which yeah. makes it even more like, wow, good, good on you, buddy. Exactly. Um, so somebody commented this, and, and um, I guess it's related, but not related. But it says, mm -hmm. tell your daughters that there are plenty of perverts and abusers out there. If a guy won't introduce you to his family, he wants to use and throw you away like the UK grooming gangs. Um, and yeah. I, I agree and I don't agree. Yes, there are a lot of horrible people out there. But I yeah. don't think the last sentence about introducing to family has to do only completely with like them using you there are there are a lot of, yeah, a bit of multiple bit of a... factors yeah like I, I i get i guess like i get what he's saying in essence like you know like you don't want to attract too much attention to your daughters because there are some pretty perverted and um dangerous people out there and you, you are absolutely right right and um i think and i've thought about this and because that is that is the 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 other side of the argument there and I think it really comes down to what's what is considered appropriate in your social setting, right? So, you know, going to going to the mall in in, in Toronto, Canada, is obviously going to be different different than going to the mall in Lebanon or you know wherever else or or you know Lebanon still very <laughs> still very liberal. Right, right. But like, and that's my point, right? So even though they're liberal, they're still very different like social norms than, um, than, and then, than Toronto, Canada, right? So, you know, like I'm in Toronto, there, it, it's full of, you know, it's a very ethnically diverse place, right? And, um, and religiously diverse place as well. And there, we don't like, there's no issue if a girl is wearing spaghetti straps or a, a crop top or whatever, like no, like, it's very it's very seldom like we it's not even on the news type of thing where you know it's not in, whatever it's not considered abnormal to see a girl showing cleavage wearing spaghetti straps or crop top or tight jeans going to walk the mall now if a girl does walk around the mall in a bikini there are going to be some heads turning from men and women right whereas in yeah, I was just going to sorry go on sorry whereas in a, in a more maybe socially conservative place in the world yeah you're not going to go to the mall in spaghetti straps a crop top and you know je tight jeans right so i think it's dependent on like whether or not to attract that you're going to attract those dangerous people or ogling eyes it's very dependent on you know where you where you live really and what those social norms are yeah and i think i was just going to add like in Sweden or in Australia or the UK, it would really depend what area you're in as well. Mm -hmm. So city, yes, but if you go to some of the suburbs that are highly Muslim population or Arab populated areas, I I have definitely gotten eyes for wearing a dress that was knee length and that was really? a bit odd for me. And this was in Australia. Yes. Yeah, it, it was very odd. And I'm like, I'd never have that in the city, but the only reason mm -hmm. I would go there was to buy to, to buy certain kinds of food or something yeah um but but it does some areas can be quite conservative even in the west and oh, i think yeah. that is a result of failed integration yes um and this is definitely another topic that i would love to talk to you or somebody else about um, on how caged um you know people or Muslims or conservative societies are when they go to the West and are oh. even more vigilant than people who live in those countries because they, they, they feel like they're actively in the middle of a place where their faith is going to be challenged and needs to be protected. Right. They take it, they take, they uh, take it. If it's like a battle for their heritage type of thing. And they end up being more religious than the people back home. Happens, exactly happens with Canadian Pakistanis like so that's who I'm exposed to obviously my wife is is Pakistani right and it and I see it all the time here I see it all the time and I'm sure it's not only with Pakistanis but here it's it, it's it's predominantly um with brown people at least it's Pakistanis and and Sikh Punjabis and um you do see that they're they're very like there's a sense of pride and all that right but it's um along with that comes some of the the, you know the, the the mindsets of the people there and um they end up segregating themselves from from society and then the community as a whole where most of them have 
have um, gone to to live end up being pretty conservative areas. And like you said, there are certain parts in Sweden where, or was it Australia where you go to the mall and it's like, wow, this doesn't feel like I'm in Australia anymore. Right. And that, and it's no different here in Toronto. There are, there are little, there are pockets where, you know, as you were talking, I was just like, Oh yeah, you know, Jane and Finch, which is a, you know, an area right here in Toronto where it's like, yeah, actually you probably couldn't wear a tank top and tight shorts because you're going to get, you're going to, you know, you're going to get hollered on and type of thing. Right. So it exists yeah. Yeah, Tariq wanted to send across his apologies. And I think maybe it would be interesting to do the same discussion from a different angle, from Tariq's angle, and also talk about um, how his separation and divorce have impacted a lot of this decision on the kids and how difficult that gets into yeah. the mix of raising children to think critically. Yeah, and, uh, and Tariq, you, you, you have kids and... Um... The, the way you raise them, like I, I know you personally, um, is absolutely admirable. And it would be great to even have other sessions like this on kids and have other people with kids on the show, right? To, to gain further insight, because at the end of the day, very few of us that have kids are actually, you know, um, you know, we're not we're not psychologists or anything like that. We don't really know how to, you know speak properly about the mind and all that all we can do is share our experiences or you know triumphs and failures and and then build from there yeah exactly um but thank you so much for your time said and i'm sure we'll have a lot more so if you guys have specific topics i know we have a few in mind um but yeah if you have other topics that you'd like us to discuss um let us know um, yeah. thank you so much perfect thanks everyone if you have any questions or comments, comments below. I always love reading them. Yes. Tag him, stock side on his Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Well, great. Thanks so much, everybody.